All right, welcome to another video, guys. This one is going to be about Diablo 4. So this is going to be my first video where I actually record some dedicated video for a game in a very long time. And uh, we're doing it for Diablo 4 right now. Extremely excited about this game. And uh, I just wanted to make a quick little... I mean, I say quick. I have no idea how long this will be. Uh, I just got a couple of notes and I just want to go over them with you. I want to share my thoughts about the game, about the experience that I've had over the past two weekends, so a total of six days uh, for the beta that we just got done playing the open and the closed beta. So like I said, I've played a total of six days, roughly 10 to 13 hour per day. It's been kind of crazy, but I don't regret it. It's been great. We've learned a lot of things and we've been testing out a bunch of stuff and uh, pretty much discovering what we don't like, what we like, and uh, the good, the bad. And I want to talk about it, okay? I just want to share it with you. I want to I wanna talk about what I think of the game. So why don't we start with aesthetics and sound? So that's going to be that's going to be quite interesting because this one is one of my favorite things. Uh, and I think it's Pretty much everybody's favorite thing. The game just looks good. Right now, I'm set on medium graphic, I think. Uh, and it still looks amazing in a lot of aspect, right? So I'm just on medium right now just because it's the beta. Not all the drivers are 100% optimized and, and polished here. And uh, I still wanted to talk about this in this current setting right here. The graphic of the game... The visuals, the textures, the models, the world, the atmosphere has been top quality for me. It's been really, really, really good for a game of this genre, of an ARPG. This is top of the line right here for me. Um, the shadows, the light, they've did, they did a really, really, really good job. And I've absolutely been blown away. It's, it's, it's been such a great experience. And not only the graphics, right? So the category is about sounds as well. Uh, the music, the ambient that they are able to establish right from the start with not only the music, with like just background audio, just like little ambient, uh, ambient sound. And uh, it's been such a treat to, to listen. I'm actually excited to be able to play this game with my headphones and just like, you know, with nothing else and just chill listening to all of this because... It's been such a good experience, even on speaker. It's been really, really good. It's been a treat to look at and to listen to. And it goes a little bit further than that for me. So obviously when you start uh, with the combat, the, the the sound that they chose for some of these spell are extremely satisfying to the point where I was almost chasing the next pack of monster to be able to use another ability to just be able to hear that corpse explosion or to be able to hear that next spell that I was going to cast, the Chain Lightning, or a, some Barbarian ability that do crazy, crazy good looking animation and sound. It just felt good, it felt snappy, and it felt powerful. It felt it felt very immersive, pretty much the word I'm looking for here. It felt really, really good in that aspect. The cinematics look absolutely amazing as well. It's really, really cool that we get to have those cinematics to happen with our character feels a lot more immersive doesn't feel like we're just a barbarian or a sorceress you're actually your own character is implemented into those cinematics and it feels good it feels great especially when you get to those later i don't want to spoil it too much for people that uh haven't necessarily seen all the things from act one but pretty much you get to meet some really really cool character and uh it just feels really really great to be in front of those character as your character that you created so that's a good point for me. The aesthetic in general, the graphic, the sound, absolutely S tier for me. I, I don't want to give any note to anything, but 10 out of 10. Okay, 10 out of 10 for that one. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the lore. Without going into any spoiler, uh, I just want to discuss it real quick. So far, from what we've seen in the beta with very limited access, this has set the tone for me story-wise in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before with an ARPG. I've usually, like, ARPG for me are the equivalent of spacebar, spacebar, or enter, enter, whatever the keybind is to skip the dialogue. 
and I'll skip things as fast as humanly possible to try to get to the next objective and try to level and get gear, right? I just don't care. Usually it's because it's not well explained, shown, demonstrated. I'm trying to find the word here, but it's it's usually not done in a good way that will either like either there's going to be lack to lack of voice acting. You're going to have to read the the text box that scroll or whatever. It's, it, sometimes it's just not really well presented and it doesn't compel you to want to listen to what's going on. Um, but I've actually been surprised that I've actually been listening to side quests. And we don't even talk about the main quest here, which has been amazing. This, this, just the act one will grab you. At, at least it did for me. It grabbed me just like the first episode of Game of Thrones did, you know, in a similar way. You get like this shock scene that will just like set the tone and the vibe for the rest of of what's to come but it doesn't look good it's creepy it's almost horror-ish and uh i liked it it was it was amazing it just i was i was like okay i'm listening to every quest from now on right so it did a really really good job with that the introduction of the game is a million time better than it was in d3 so it was really really good i'm gonna compare the previous game and other games obviously because i guess we all do this when it comes to a game like this yeah the the, the story really grabbed me early on and it was really really fun to listen to and even side characters it was just like sometimes you'll just meet like a side character that's half dying and he hands you a quest go get there i was just like yes yes talk let's i, I wanted to help him <laughs> so they give you cool they give you cool quests there's cool dialogue uh, obviously, most people are probably going to end up skipping the side quest, just like enter, 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 shut up, give me my reward. But I was actually enjoying it. There's cool voice acting. Some of them have really, really cool voice. There's really cool characters, and you'll discover some fun stuff. So for me, the lore was really, really good. Obviously, I can't really give it a rating. We don't know where the hell things are going. I don't know who's good. I don't know who's bad, uh, and I don't know what's going on. But so far, it's looking pretty good, and uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful for what's to come for this. All right, so next I want to talk about the gameplay, uh, which I think is one of the really, really cool aspect of this game, and uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go right in there. I'm just gonna, I just wanna run around while while we talk, and pretty much uh, the gameplay has been really, really great. So on top of having the great visual, the great sound, the animations for the spell, and how snappy the combat feels, has been a really 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 good bonus so the gameplay feels really really good because the gameplay and the combat feels thoughtful it feels like you're planning things a little bit more it makes you think about what's your next move and uh a good example of that for example right now i'm on my necromancer but a good example of that would be on the rogue where you're going to have poisons that you're going to need to apply to your weapon so usually you're going to go around gathering mob, you're going to apply your poison, then you're going to build up your combo point or your resources, and then you're going to unleash your ability, and then the shadow poison arrow thing is going to do explosive damage, and everything is going to set up, and it's going to be great, it's going to look good, and it's going to be really, really fun, right? So there's not only spam one button, you know, like teleport to a location, one shot the pack, teleport to the next one. It's a little bit more thoughtful. There's a lot of setting up. There's a lot of cool things that can happen that will make you feel a little bit, I don't want to say proud, but, you know, at the end of a combat, at the end of an encounter, you'll feel like you did something right instead of just having press one button and just having it, you know, blow over. And in a lot of cases, it will end up happening this way, especially some build right now in the beta are kind of crazy where you can get like infinite corpse explosion with something like blood mist, which is... A little bit broken, but, you know, it's a beta, so hopefully things will get tuned a little bit. But in general, the combat has felt very, very, very snappy. Some classes will have a little bit more delay in their in their spells and in their animation. And one of those is going to be, for example, Druid, uh, even Barbarian. So those classes are a little bit more slowed down, I would say. It's not necessarily a big deal deal for me because I kind of feel like it puts a little bit of weight and emphasis on a lot of the ability that you use. So that always felt really, really good to me, especially when I started playing early on with the Barbarian. Uh, there is an ability that you use. You will do like a backswing on the ground and then you'll throw uh, like your axe forward and move a lot of the ground, a lot of the dirt and do a, an upfront swing. And it looks really, really good. It felt snappy. There was a delay to the animation, but it makes it feel like it's going to hit hard. Druid has a lot of those things as well. A lot of your ability takes a little bit for them to cast. So 
if you're going to press hurricane for example you, you just stop for a little bit you kind of just get the animation rolling and there's a lot of these that you got to ramp up right and uh, a lot of your abilities especially like companion ability there's a little bit of delay to the wolf leaping around for example that's gonna be that's gonna be a little bit of a problem a lot of slower animation on those melee hit which can sometimes result in you missing your target entirely as it runs off, right? Because... Uh, uh. So sometimes that can feel a little bit of a problem. But it's not every class and it's not every ability. And it's it also has a little bit of a, um, of a curse kiss effect. So obviously, some slower ability can be a little bit more complicated to play around. You have to time your things more. But when they do hit, they feel pretty rewarding. Outside of generator. So when the slow generator happened... It's not like you get a massive reward, you get a little bit of resources, you know, like your ability you want to be pressing are going to be those big spender where you're going to get those quaking effect and just like massive wave that are just going to decimate the screens of minion. So that's going to be that's going to be the, the, the reward, I guess. So it can take a little bit more build up, a little bit more preparation. In this case, the pulverized build, there's a lot of planning up, right? You got I me mean, a lot of planning up. You gotta wait for your pulverize to, to to reach to reach at their max, and then you can use the earthen bulwark to empower your ability and do more damage because you get this legendary, and then you have this one with the barrier. So you know, and then you're gonna build up also the um, basic scale, increase core damage. So you're gonna be looking for you know like a, a pack of elite, and as you go to the, to that pack, you're going to build up your stacks, and as you get to the elite pack, you'll unleash your your pulverize right. So you. You're just building it up slowly, then you shield, and then you unleash, and then you get this massive crit, right? So you you have to just go around the combat and weave in. It's a little bit more of a dance than just, you know, blink, blizzard, blink, blizzard, or whatever, whirlwind, or you just, just spam one ability, right? So there's a little bit more thought into it, and uh, it feels really, really good. The combat feels snappy. You'll notice it, especially on, like, rogue melee, or even the bow rogue, but mostly on the dagger melee version of the rogue combat just feels good like if you're into that type of class i think you'll have a really really good time everything feels really snappy quick and precise and you feel rewarded when those things line up in your combat rotation for something like druid it felt uh, a little bit more slow but it felt more deliberate and everything had a lot of weight to it which can be good can be a little bit of anno an annoyance in some uh, occasion right whereas sorceress sorceress Everything is almost instant. Everything is just really, really quick, snappy, which makes them really strong right now, right? So everything is just very fluid, and uh, it can be quite scary. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun, especially for uh, PvP. That should be very, very fun. I'm excited, obviously, for the dungeon clearing and all of that. But for PvP, this this gameplay, this, this, uh, this emphasis on having very meaningful key press and ability and having everything snaps together i think that's going to be really really good so gameplay for me has been another massive massive hit into the game uh it just feels really 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 good and uh yeah i'm excited to see like everything that they could come up with right so obviously eventually we'll have expansions new class we'll we'll, we'll develop even more talent tree and stuff and we're gonna have so much more things and the engine that this is built on and the core of the game is really, really, really good. All right, so now I want to talk about a pretty cool point, build customization. This is beta. We have limited access to the content. Level has been capped. We're missing a lot of information. But I still want to talk about what my reaction was to seeing a lot of these options. You know, like seeing a lot of this customization, seeing the talent tree and all of that. So... Uh, we're going to go right here on the Sork as, I think, a very good example of uh, of a template class. The Sork is really, really, really good. It's one of the best class right now, and it feels great. And it's in big part because of how well the talent tree has been designed. And obviously, a lot of it has been really, I would say, overpower in a lot of cases. There's a lot of things that are creating like pretty crazy build right now that are almost completely making most of the content pretty meaningless right now. Everything has been pretty much conquered with uh, with the Sork. It's been, it's been really, really good to, to just run around and, and kill stuff with a lot of ease. Let's put it that way. Uh, my first impression when opening the skill tree. So there's a lot of things that goes into building your character. Uh, one of the first one you're probably going to encounter is going to be your skill tree. So if you press A on your keyboard, you open up the skill tree. 
uh, you'll have a little blinking yellow square or triangle going right over here. That's going to tell you that you have a skill point very early on in the game as you kill a couple of your first wolf or skeleton. And uh, you're going to be able to allocate your first point. So they went into a path that is a little bit similar to what Diablo 2 was in a way, right? So in Diablo 2, uh, you were forced to start at the start of the tree and then make your way down. And as you did this, you had to encounter, usually, for example, if you went for a cold sork, you had to put a point in your first ice bolt or uh, frost bolt, right? Your, your first filler spell, your, your first little ability. But then it transitioned to more meaningful ability. And then at the end, you wouldn't even use the first ability. And it was simply all of a chain that was being synergized, right? So points into Frostbolt would increase the damage into the second Frostbolt. It was like Icebolt, Frostbolt, and Blizzard. I don't remember the name exactly, but they were just chaining down each other. And points into the first one was increasing the second and the third ability. And it was just... But at the end of the day, you would just use Blizzard, right? Nothing else really matter too much there was some other occasion and different builds obviously where you would want some different freeze effect and everything but in general you would use the latest down ability you would spend that and you would use a couple of utility like teleport and shield you would macro those and you would be good to go and then in diablo 3 they pretty much allowed us to do whatever you could put pretty much whatever on your bar you had access to every ability you just chose uh which one you wanted to use by simply socketing them into your uh, into your action bar, and then you could customize them with passive. This time around, they're doing a little bit of a mix of both, I would say. So as you place your first point, you're forced to spend a point into a generator, right? So by default, let's say that we ever get to... I don't really hope so, because I wasn't a big fan of these. But in Diablo 3, there was a lot of build that you would simply use like a massive cooldown, like Land of the Dead, that would allow your spell to be used without cost then there was cooldown reduction that was applied that would then make it so that land of the dead would lower in cooldown if there was enough density and then you would repeat this process endlessly farming the map just keeping this massive cooldown up forever and not using any of your generator completely skipping the generator part so it seems that now blizzard is kind of forcing us to pick a generator to try to avoid the situation that doesn't mean that it will be avoided there's already builds out there that use no generator like this one uh because sork with this build doesn't even use mana so i mean it's not really a generator it's more of a filler spell that will trigger additional effect right so there's no uh they don't really generate mana outside of maybe some of the fire stuff uh sometimes that will have mana generation into it because they take into account that you're going to be spamming meteor and that you're going to need to regenerate mana a little bit on paper, that's not what's happening right now, but that's the goal, right? That's what they're that's what they're going for. So you pretty much choose whichever filler or uh, basic skill that you want to use, right? So these are always available to cast. They don't cost anything. They're just your default filler, right? And they have a cool little talent tree at the bottom. You can customize it. It's usually going to be uh, either some utility, some meta regen, some chill, some vulnerable, some extra single target, some extra AOE, and then you get to customize that. Uh, once you've put three points into this, you can move on. Actually, two points, sorry. So you can just put one point and then one point, and then you move on to the next category, which allows you to get to the core. The core are usually going to be your main ability that you're going to spam all the time in most cases. So for Sork, uh, not necessarily the case, but, you know, it's things are going to get tuned in. So you have Incinerate, for example. You got Fireball, so you have, like, your two Fire Spell. You have two Ice Spells. You have a Frozen Orb. You have Ice Shard. Chain Lightning and Charge Bolt. None of these have cooldown, but they have a mana cost. So you're not going to be able to spam them forever, in theory, right? And then they each have their little path. You're going to get also some random passive over here and, you know, all that good stuff. So I'm a big fan of this talent tree. I like it. I really, really like it. It gives a little bit more possibility, a little bit more customization uh, than I think it did with Diablo 3, for example. I really, really do enjoy it. It's been great. There's some aspect of it that fell a little bit off for me. For example, uh, right now with Sork on the beta, we're using a Hydra build. Most people are using a Hydra build where pretty much Hydra doesn't really cost anything, right? It costs 18 mana. That's not really a spender. You're not going to be, because you're, you're not spamming it. You're using it every once in a while. And then the rest of your ability are going to be utility. So like a Flame Shield, Frost Nova, none of these cost mana. Your major cooldown, like Deep Freeze or the other Snake one, Inferno. 
uh, Ice Blade. Like, none of this costs mana. So your mana pool is always up. So you don't need to use a filler. You always have something to kind of just press and go around with. So these points are kind of wasted. Obviously, you could use the Fireball to put it as one of the Ancient uh, spell here. That's a possibility if you wanted some burn. But other than that, it's this point is pretty much wasted. So it's just the filler to get here. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's not like, it's just, you know, you put points into this and you don't even put it on your bar. That fell off a little bit. So that made me question, would I like the idea of having synergy back? Where putting points into Firebolt would increase the damage of Fireball. Which would then increase the damage of Hydra or whatever, right? So, I don't know. The question is, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I liked synergy. But maybe it's just more nostalgic than anything else. I feel like it because it kills a little bit the possibility of hybrid build, right? So maybe it's not a good idea. There's just these little side cases that don't really work for me. But for Sork, it's actually pretty cool because even if you put point in Fireball and don't use it, you can still use it for its enchant effect, like we just like I just explained here in a second ago, right? So Fireball is really really strong. The, en the enchantment effect is that when you kill an enemy, they explode in a fireball. So whatever points you put in fireball will be used as that effect as you put it here. Which is really, really, really cool. It has This can be changed in combat, by the way, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and you can have two of it once you hit level 30. So this aspect of it is really, really cool. It offers really, really good customization of your character. And uh, that's a really cool use of the tree. Not every node is going to feel really good. There's going to be passive that are going to feel really, really awful. Especially with the current playstyle of fire that doesn't even use mana. So you have an entire tree here of using mana, uh, mana regen, and a bunch of other stuff that don't really work. But that's all tuning based. So it's not like, you know, crazy the end of the world. But in general, I like the tree. I really, really do. Um, it, it, it has really, really good possibilities. I've been enjoying it a lot. Not every class is a really, really good tree. Uh, or a perfect tree, I would say. But most of them, it felt really, really good. You know, like, I, I I got to a new node, and I was pretty much ex always excited. But it's not always the case. Uh, for example, Necromancer as a node where you only have two curse. And that felt a little bit boring to me. Uh, that, that, I got to that node, and I was like, okay. Uh, I don't really feel like using these two curse. I don't need to slow anything. I don't need Iron Maiden. So you pretty much just skip it, or you put points into the passive, right? So when you do land on these... Uh, it happens a lot more with Necromancer because you get, like, such a massive part of your build for free, which is, like, Skeletal Warrior, which has its own thing here, which isn't part of the talent tree, that when you look at your talent tree, it looks empty some places, right? So this node only has two abilities. This one only has three, right? So it looks a little bit more empty than Sork, for example, which had way more options on a lot of these nodes, right? Uh... This one only has two ability, right? So it's very limited ability when it comes to Necromancer. Uh, you know, like, it has it has three ultimate, two ability here, two ability here, three here. If we compare to what we just saw with Sork, there was way more things. But again, Necromancer is something to balance out. So, you know, it is what it is for that. I think it's a good, it's, it's a step in the good direction. I think it plays well and it builds well, and I'm excited about it overall. Especially when it's going to combine with something like Paragon. So we don't have necessarily like... I mean, we kind of know what it is. We have al already uh, some some things online that will show us pretty much exactly what every point in the Paragon grid is. Um, so that's available online. I'll even maybe put a link in the description below for it if you want to check it out. Very much Paragon is this system where you'll have massive grid that you can put points into that will mostly be pretty much boring stats in a lot of ways. So in strength and some stuff like that but along the way you're gonna get path for legendary pieces legendary uh paragon board by the way paragon worst name to call this system because it doesn't feel or look like the previous paragon system which gets a lot of people confused because your first 50 level you'll be able to put point into the skill tree which will result in 56 maybe i don't know i don't know how much skill tree exactly because you get you get additional reward for all of this stuff right here. So additional skill point here. And I think you get one of these per zone. And I don't know exactly how many, but you'll get a bunch of skill point 50 plus something. And then at level 50 plus, so from 50 to 100, you get to put Paragon points in this massive board, which is four point, I think, per level that you're going to be putting into this. 
and it's going to allow you some extra customization when it comes to stats, life, and even things that change your playstyle. You're going to get some legendary Paragon board slot that are going to affect things in pretty meaningful way. There's not a lot of them. There's one usually per board, and then there's a glyph slot. And the glyph is another piece that allows you to socket something into it that will change your playstyle a little bit. So the Paragon board isn't going to drastically change the way you play your class, but it will modify it and it will allow you to customize the path. And I think this path is way more complex than people expect it to be. This game is approaching the level of customization of other ARPG way more than it resembles the depth of previous Diablo games. So the depth of previous Diablo game was pretty limited. This one is increasing uh, a lot, quite a lot. So the customization is going to be pretty much there. Uh, there's going to be, it's going to be a lot more work, I think, to figure out like what necessarily the best builds are and all that stuff. But I think that's part of the fun, at least for me. There's going to be a lot of people out there putting guides and all of that good information. So shouldn't be too bad. And on top of all of this, we come down to legendary. So that's another way to build, to customize your build. So every single slot in your inventory is going to have a legendary power, which I think is a really, really cool way. We're going to talk a little bit more about item customization coming up, but this is going to be a really cool way to customize your character as well. So on top of all those skill tree, those paragon, you also get the uh, legendary power and also unique power that is going to be added on top of this. You get some gem as well for your gear and you get some really, really, really cool stuff. So overall, build customization for me is a big plus. A couple of things that I think the tree could do a little bit better in some aspect. If I want to be, if I want to criticize something, the tree could be a little bit better. Obviously, like I'm not even going to talk about tuning some passive or absolutely horrible uh some passive are really really bad you don't even want to ever touch them uh so there's obviously a tuning problem in a for a couple of these but uh you know like just in general the tree felt pretty good but it, there's a couple of things that i would like to see upgraded right that isn't tuning related so that's a net positive for me very very good i love the customization all right so now we're going to talk about the itemization so the itemization is actually better than I thought it was going to be. We saw some early screen screenshot um, initially of what uh, items would be looking like. And it was, you know, we I had mixed feeling about it. It, it looked very Diablo 3-esque. And I was not a big fan of the Diablo 3 itemization. I much uh, prefer the Diablo 2 itemization or even something that gets a little bit closer to something like Path of Exile, Last Epoch. Those have some very interesting item for me. I've always been a big fan of things like um, plus skills. Plus skills in Diablo 2 is one of my favorite thing of all time. I don't know why. It's just satisfying to get plus two added to your entire tree. It felt really, really good, especially with synergy because it will it would double dip on all your spell and it felt really, really good, right? Uh, I like simple things. When you look at an item and it's like, you know, like I think stats, just generic like combat stats were a little bit boring uh, because they don't give you like a clear idea of what you're getting out of it, right? You have to like, you know, okay, dexterity that gives me this, you know, where I've always been a big fan of just like, you know, fire damage, minion attack speed, uh, life, life percent revs, you know, like it's, the, those are, the, are pretty much like the, the perfect way to itemize item. Uh, but they've done something pretty interesting here, which, um, is different in Diablo 3. So not every item is going to have stats on it. Actually, most of your gear is probably not even going to end up having stats on it for a lot of the beta, right? Because a lot of the other stats have a lot of weight. We don't know how far these stat will actually scale. Um, some build might prefer having just raw skill stats, like stacking a lot of intelligence will give you some skill damage, which will be really good. But then the math might comes around where, oh no, actually you don't really want int. You would much rather have like attack speed, critical strike chance, and then plus one skill. Because plus one skill is insane. That's 10% increase on your skill. Like every point you put into an ability, increases the damage by a static 10%, roughly, right? So that's always really, really good. Those are going to be very sought after. Uh, there's even some plus two skill. I've found a plus two, um, and there's probably going to be even higher ones, right? So it is said that stats will, will, will greatly increase in range once you get to the higher level of the game. So itemization is better, right? So not every piece of gear is going to have intelligence, strength, 
and then a bunch of stats, right? So you, you might find out just the random array of shit like this, right? So we got dexterity, willpower, and intelligence. So, and then some poison res, right? So already that's a little bit more interesting that not everything necessarily comes with your default stat on it. It, it can just be a bunch of res and a bunch of little percentages. Some cold damage, some crit chance, some lucky hit, some physical stuff. Cool, awesome, great. That sounds fun. By the way, this item is horrible for my build, but whatever. Um, so already I think it's a, an improvement. Um, there's, I think, some aspect of it that I don't like. Uh, and one of the, one of them is lucky hit. So, I mean, lucky hit, it's not that I don't like it. It's just, I think it's poorly worded slash explain. It ends up being a little bit more complicated. I spend the like 10 minute on stream today, trying to understand it, having to go online and try to figure out how it works. And it's actually pretty complex and the UI doesn't really explain it to you. So, um, skills, for example, have a lucky hit chance. Right? So, and that's pretty much your proc chance of that skill proccing whatever lucky hit thing you might have. So lucky hit might come from various sources. You might get them from talent, abilities. You might get them from gear, right? I don't know if I have any lucky hit, but sometimes you'll get like a random lucky hit on your gear that will just say, um, like for example, here I have lucky hit chance. So this will just increase my chance globally of getting more lucky hit. But if I have an item that actually have a lucky hit proc on it, then you just pretty much add up all those percentages and you get your proc rate based on whatever ability you use. For example, lucky hit. When you hit a crowd control enemy, there's a 32% chance that the crowd control uh, effect spreads through another unaffected target. So it's not 32% chance per hit. You actually have to fa factor the proc rate of your ability. Uh, so, for example, if I cast a Bone Spear, it's 52%, right? I think baseline this is 50, but I think it uh, the tooltip might add the actual bonus that you have from gear. Because I saw this at 50 earlier, so I would have to double check that. But pretty much um, the lucky hit from this has to be multiplied by... Uh, your default lucky hit, and then by the one on the tooltip, and then it will round up to, if you use this spell, you'll get a 3% chance to have it proc, right? So that's like one part of it that I think is a little bit confusing. Because when you read this, most people will go, 32% chance, that's insane. That means like, every three attack on that enemy will spread my crowd control to another target. But in reality, that's not what it is. You have to do like, you have to do the whole math sequence and just add up and multiply everything by each other and you'll get like a two to three percentage. Sorry, I'm not a math professor, but you'll get roughly like your 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 percentage, which will come down to two, three, four, five, six, seven percent chance when you use that ability for the proc to happen. There's a math formula online that actually shows you. I shouldn't necessarily have to go read on max roll the math formula to know like it's just not well explained. I think they could do a little bit of a better job with this. That's one of the little things. But I think it's cool because they have a lot of dials on gear for the proc chance, which is the lucky hit on there. So it, each ability have a different, you know, so this one would suck to try to proc something. But obviously you can cast it more frequently and you have more of it. So it's just the tuning number that Blizzard can adjust on every single one of those ability. If an ability ends up proccing two more, they just tune that one, click, and then it's it's balanced then right instead of just having to nerf the entire lucky hit mechanic right so that's that's good in theory for them to tune and do everything but for the user on the other hand you're you go like what the hell is happening right now what you know like you just you just end up not really understanding and it it's not really explained well in here either so it's not really explained too well so the same thing happens with overpower um the overpower mechanic is Explain a little bit better over here. So overpower will do increased damage based on your life and your fortify. It's a very low chance and it will apply to the entire skill. So if an ability overpowers, every single hit of that ability will overpower. If I cast Bone Storm, which is a 60 second cooldown that lasts for 10 seconds and it happens to overpower, it will overpower for the whole 10 second. Every hit of the ability will overpower and do crazy damage. Most of the time, it seems that overpower 
is made for classes that are a little bit more tanky. So like Earth Druid will have that uh, because they're very much based around like being more tanky with the Fortified. Bear Druid will have Overpower. Uh, Blood Necromancer because it's made up with having high HP and then building high Fortify, which will then lead to high Overpower damage. So it creates those specs that are pretty much, all right, tank, 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 survive, survive, survive. Bam! Massive overpower hit, decimate everything, right? Which leads to the gameplay that we showed earlier with the, the, the Druid Bear, which was just pretty much survive at high HP, accumulate your 10 stack, which guarantees an overpower, and then you do a massive overpower hit. Which can be a cool play style in some circumstances. I think it can create some fun stuff. But overall on the gear, it just gets a little bit complicated. So those things are things that could be improved um, for the itemization. But in general, I love the itemization. It's a lot better. It's a massive improvement from what we have before. There's still item power. So arbitrarily, like, item would higher... I mean, it's not arbitrarily, arbitrary. It's just item with higher item level power will generate higher ar array of stats. Instead of having a tier of stats like PoE or Last Epoch, where... You can get Intelligence Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, Tier... You know, and then they have each their own bracket. So this is item-based. So it's if you drop an item at low level, it can't drop with a high tier of Intelligence. It will always be a low bracket of Intelligence possibility because it's low item power. But overall, I think it feels pretty good. Uh, the depth of the itemization is a lot better in this version than in Diablo 3. I think it's a net improvement for me. Uh, when it comes to this game, I had a lot more fun working around my items. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about the, de the details going over every item because like rare right now drop with three stats, legendary drop with four. Um, and then you can extract the power out of a legendary, create an aspect which contains the power and then apply it to any item you want that are in the allowed type for that item, which creates a really, really cool item searching grind i i'm a big fan of it it looks really really cool uh but in general it's going to be really tough to find a lego with four good stats on it right it's going to be really really tough and re-rolling stats on a legendary is very costly right gold is a very precious resources a resources in diablo 4 so it gets really, really complicated but you can settle for finding a good rare that has exactly the, the the stats that you want for example this i was building a shadow uh build the other day and it this has attack speed crit chance amazing and then it has plus one rank blight which was something that i was using so this comes this is a rare that i imprinted a legendary power on it became a legendary but you can see it's an old rare because it only has three stats right so sometimes it's worth it to look for those rare it's, it's actually really really good because you're going to want to look for those two good stats and then maybe re-roll the third one because it's actually, it's actually very cheap to re-roll on a rare compared to a legendary but apparently you can actually roll uh later on rare with up to five affix on them or five stats if that's true that's actually kind of cool because that means that rare are going to have value for the entirety of the game instead of being this thing where in diablo 3 they were just mats gathering you would literally come back from your rift and just auto de uh, auto disenchant all of it, and you wouldn't care about it, right? And I've always loved Rare in Diablo 2. They had a big space in the gearing environment. Obviously, you're not going to be wearing Rare. You're, it's always going to turn into a Legendary because you're always going to imprint a power upon it. Why wouldn't you? But uh, they're always going to matter in looking out for them in your inventory. You're always going to be on the lookout for plus one skill with the proper stats, right? And especially if later on, you, it can get more than three stats. If it can get up to five, then we could it could technically be better than actual Legendary. So we'll have to see. I don't want to get too far into this because it's all speculation and things that I have no idea about, but that's pretty much it. I love it. Feels really, really good. Each, like, item slot has its own power stuff. So, like, offensive Legendary that you can find in here, for example, in Collection. Offensive Legendary can be put on Amulet. Weapon, glove, ring. Defensive can be put on shield, helm, armor, pants, ammy. Resources, just ring. Utility, these ones. Mobility, these ones. You can see that ammy is always there. So it's like your, your wild card. Ammy also has uh, the cool thing of being able to grant you 50% increased power. Which means that, for example, if you have something that gives you plus two skeleton... 
if you remove it, if you grab it, put it on, ne on a necklace, uh, it will become three because it will increase by 50%. But if you put it on a two-ended weapon, it will become four because it will increase by 100%. So there's this whole twist of being able to put the right legendary power where you need it and uh, using the percentage of those the scaling uh, to a higher level, right? And it, it, it's really, really fun. Itemization, really, really good. Not perfect, not perfect, but an absolute improvement over Diablo 3. I still think there's a couple of things that could be taken from other ARPG that are really cool and interesting. But again, I'll take it. This is really, really good, and it's an improvement. So, so far, everything has been pretty much an improvement over the, the last version of the game for me, uh, for my opinion. So that's it for itemization. There's a million other things I could say. There's also unique that we haven't even been able to test, but they're already out there, which are insanely powerful item that each have their own. They have like predeterministic stats, but with a range that can that can that can change. You can look them up online. Those are going to be like super build defining, and uh, it's going to be really fun to play around them. And they're going to be super rare, so they're going to be fun to hunt. And when you drop one, you're going to know exactly what it is and that it's good, right? It's not going to be like, shit, I hope that this 12 million pair of Frostburn that I drop finally has good stats on it. No, it's going to be like, oh shit, I just got a Shaco. It's going to have plus two all skills. That's insane. You immediately get excited about it, and that's good. That's what was so cool about Diablo 2. When you drop that green teal helmet on the ground, you lost your shit, right? You knew the item was good. Anyway, I'm rambling on itemization. Love it. Amazing. All right, so we're now back in town here, and I want to talk about crafting. Not really crafting as I would have liked, or a lot of people would have liked, but it's still a little bit of crafting, and I think it's a little bit more interesting uh, than what we had, so that's quite cool. It might, it might be more things that I haven't seen or don't understand, but from what we've had in the beta so far, there's pretty much three systems. You're going to get the blacksmith, which allows you to upgrade your gear. So you simply put your gear here. Every gear has a number of tier available. This item can be upgraded four time. It will cost you resources that you can see right here. So it will cost you some veiled crystal, some ore, and some iron chunks. The iron chunks and the silver ore are found in the world. Uh, you'll be able to find them by simply like breaking down... Uh, by breaking down like uh, the vein that you're going to find, the iron vein and the silver vein that you're going to find. So you click them just like the plants. Bloop, they drop, you loot them, good to go. This is going to be found from salvaging rare. And then you use those material with a large chunk of gold and you upgrade and you get better just things. So for example, upgrading this from uh, 342 plus 10 to 342 plus 15 item power will give me the following. Plus 9 damage, a little bit more crit, a little bit more int, a little bit more percentage here, a little bit more this, a little bit more that, right? So, boom. Hey, voila. So, now I got a better uh, sword. It is now tier 3 instead of being tier 2. And I think that's pretty cool. So, you're going to want to not only find the best item out there uh, with the perfect stat and print it with the perfect legendary power, but then you're going to want to upgrade them higher up. Uh, there's another system, which is really cool. The other two systems are pretty much exactly similar to what we had in um in diablo 3 so far i haven't found anything that allows me to directly craft item i don't think that's going to be a possibility uh but you can craft gem so obviously we have the gem crafting system three of this makes one of this and then three of the new one creates the next rank and so on and so forth you can do this it costs gold a pretty sizable amount of gold and boom you get a new gem you can unsock it uh it seems to be free no, actually, it's not. 6,000. So, gold is important in Diablo 4, which is good. I love that. I absolutely love that. Gold has value. And you can remove socket. Uh, you can add sockets. So you can add up to two on a chest, for example. So, I can do this. One. And then I'm not going to be able to do it because I don't have another scattered prism, which is found from world bosses, which I have been skipping on mine. So, I'm not going to be able to show you the second socket. But I think chest can have two socket. Uh, sorry, I said chest, pants. I, I, for some reason, I'm used to chest being here and shoulder being here, right? It used to be helm, shoulder, glove, chest, or whatever. It fucks with me. Uh, this is pants. You can, I think you can still put two on pants, though. Pretty sure. So two on pants, two on chest. 
one one uh, one on uh Ami, one on ring, one on ring, two on two ended, one on one ended. And I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, you can't have sockets on the glove and boots. We have because you don't want holes in your shoes, right? So it makes sense. Pretty simple, really, really simple, really, really simple system. And then you can upgrade your jewelry the same way that you could upgrade your armor at the jeweler. So you, each of these can have up to uh, four upgrade. I don't know if it goes further than four tier, but for now, that's what we got. We got some four tier. And the last crafting option that we have so far is this little guy right here in this little shop. And this is part of the, this is the biggest aspect of the game, I would say, right? So what happens here is you can imprint aspects. So as we were talking about, you got these aspect that you have uh, in your little tab right here. So these are from extracted legendary. So I can go ahead and extract here. I could put my boots in here and extract them to get this power. This power will then go into the aspect tab and I'm going to be able to use it once. So the whole process of this is that you want to farm these legendaries, find one that has a high percentage legendary power, extract it, and then slam it on the best rare or legendary that you can find with that has the perfect stats, right? So that's the whole system. Uh, there's another aspect of this, which is the Codex of Power. Codex of Power are legendary power that are going to be found and obtained from doing dungeons. Not all legendary power are in here, but this system is pretty much made to allow you to kickstart a build or create alts. Because when you create a legendary using a power from the codex of power, it will always roll at its weakest percentage. Which means that, let's say that I'm looking at this one here, or this chest here, or any of my item, right? This one. This one has 20 to 40% on the advanced tooltip, and it rolled 28. If I extract it, I will extract it at 28, and when I replace it, I will replace it at 28. But if this happened to have been a power, because I don't think it is, but if it would have happened to be a aspect, right? For example, it would be at 20%. It would always craft, if I use it from the Codex of Power, it will always craft at its lowest percent. And that's because the system is made to help you kickstart a build. Let's say you're missing a piece, you're leveling up, you just want to get a couple of legendary power that you find from the dungeons. You want to apply them, get things started, get things rolling. Uh, this is a really good system for that. They're infinite. You can use them as many times as you want. You can reapply them to as many items as you want. They're there. They're yours. But they're going to be weak. Your goal is going to be to find uh, these legendaries and get them at high percentage and slam them on the best item you can and upgrade them. Then if you find a better item, you need to refarm a new legendary and extract a new one and then slam it. Because you cannot extract a legendary that's been imprinted. Okay? So that's that cannot be done. So if I already have an imprinted Lego... And I try to extract it like this one here. It's imprinted. It's going to tell me cannot extract from imprinted. So it's a one time. It's a one time thing. You cannot keep recycling legendaries forever. And then the rest of this is pretty much you have enchant. So enchant is re-rolling stats. It's exactly like it was in Diablo 3. You have a choice between all of your stats. You click which one you want to re-roll. So you're like and damage reduction from distant enemy. Don't care. You click enchant. It will show you three new stats. You pick whichever one or you click none. And then you have to restart. Every time you do it, it's going to increase in cost. So every single time that you click that button, the gold cost is going to go up. And it goes really crazy high for legendaries. That's why rare are very important, because they cost less to roll. They're going to be your base. They're going to be your canvas. You're going to find them. You're going to re-roll them. You're going to tweak them. And uh, you're, you're going to... Having a good rare imprinted with a legendary power that has three perfect stats is better than an item in most cases that's a legendary with four shit stats, right? So that's why it's so important. They're they're easier to mold and customize and get to you exactly how you want it. So that's going to be the enchant system here. Uh, pretty straightforward. Then you have this uh, the craft sigil. This is going to be for the end game system. So we're going to talk about that uh, maybe in another video. So this is going to be for your like tier dungeon for your end game loop, right? So that is uh, pretty much shit about crafting. Uh, it could have been better. Could have been better. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. It could definitely have had, like, uh, allowed me to maybe... Like, there was so many cool examples of really, really nice crafting being done with, like, Last Epoch and Path of Exile, where you can, like, shard aspect of an item and then replace it for a cost. But again, this is, like, the gaming loop. This is the loop they're going for, and I'm okay with it. I think it's cool. I think it's fine. I think it's going to work well. We're going to have a lot of nice uh, item hunting, and I think it's going to work really, really well. 
and it's going to be really, really fun. Uh, so those are the three system here. But they seem to work well with what they've got in store for us. So we'll see what the future holds. Maybe things are going to be worked on in the future. Maybe new system are going to be created. Uh, maybe we're going to see a new vendor in a, in, a, in a season or an expansion with more crafting options. This can always be improved and developed on. I think for the launch of this game, this is plenty enough with the loop that we have. We're going to be hunting items forever, uh, which is kind of cool. I'm happy about that. It's really, really cool. Love it. And uh, now we're going to be talking about the user interface, which I think is probably one of the weakest point of the game. And uh, some aspect of it look really, really pretty, like in terms of visual. Uh, some aspect of it feel a little bit unfinished. So, I mean, we could talk about like design choice, font usage, and all that stuff. But the, all of that is opinion based. I don't really want to talk about the color, the font, the pixel, the padding. Although I'm very interested in those topics. That's not what I want to talk about. There's a couple of design decisions that are a little bit weird. Uh, that I hope are going to get fixed. I know a million people have already made video about this, but um, there's some weird stuff. Having a button named Material and Stats. It's kind of weird to me, right? It's two things that are completely different. I know it was similar in Diablo 3, but it's really, really weird. If I just want to look at my stats, right? I'm like, ah, oh, shit, how much crit do I have? That should be visible to me, like, really simply in an ARPG. How much crit I have, right? But I have to click on material and stats, and then I get brought into a tab with flowers and rocks. Then I have to click on the eye here, and I have to scroll down to be able to see. If I was looking at my overpower chance, for example, I don't even see it in like three actions or four, like one, two, three, you know, like. So it's it's actually I'm, I'm dumb. It was right here. I picked a bad example. I don't want to hear about it. Okay. My damage with physical, okay? It's a little bit far down. I mean, the scrolling isn't really an issue. The problem is just having to do so many clicks and go through so many hoops to find something that I think in an ARPG should be very simple to find. Like, a very easy solution would just be to have a material button next to your currency, right? Your, your gold, your shard, and your curiosity vendor tokens, your obols. You could have a little bag option or crafting material here. Click on that. That opens this menu. And then have the stats here. And a display maybe better stats here. Because in most cases, you don't care to... I don't think... I mean, I, personally, I don't care about knowing that I have 34 strength. I, I don't know. It's pretty irrelevant to me to know that. I would much rather be able to maybe uh, put a star, a favorite star, on some of these stats. Let's say that I'm building a Necromancer. And I need a couple of things. I need shadow damage. I need a uh, lucky hit, for example. I don't know. I'm just making shit up as I go, right? Crit, lucky hit, shadow damage, right? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be really, really cool if I could just go in here and put a star on lucky hit, right? Or whatever, wherever it is, right? In the stats. And just mark, like, four stats that I care about. That would be dope. That would be really, really fun. That would be a good way to do it. Because you have 42 willpower. I have to mouse over it. I mean, obviously, it's easy. The conversion is 4.2. But it's just a little bit useless. Most builds are not necessarily going to want to stack some of these stats. Uh, I'm not going to want to stack strength to get more armor. I'm probably going to get a legendary that increase armor for me instead. Uh, because, like, strength has very little value per point for me. Even though I probably need armor, uh, there's probably a better way for me to get it, right? So, in most cases, I'm probably going to want intelligence. Um... Probably not going to want willpower because I don't do over... Uh, so willpower would be really good for a blood build because you need resource regen and you need overpower damage. So that would be a good one. But for this build, not really. I'm probably going to focus on intelligence and maybe some other raw stats, right? Um, so yeah, it's it would be cool if we could choose maybe or customize this a little bit more. This interface is a little bit sketchy. That's just my, my opinion on it. Uh, the map... Uh, I love the map. I think it's really good. It, it has some clunkiness to it. Some stuff is still buggy a little bit, like quests and stuff, but it, it is what it is. That's not the end of the world. That can always be fixed. Those are usually bug more than, like, actual issues. But, um, so the lack of overlay is, um, is a little bit problematic for a lot of people. You kind of want to know where you're heading, and you have a little mini-map here that can be zoomed, move, or you can't do anything about it. It's very far in the corner right there, and... 
it's hard to guide yourself. So you always have to like open map mid dungeon, try to figure out where you're heading. It would be cool to have a transparency mode to be able to overlay this, especially in dungeon and pretty much even in open world. You can't see your health right now. Like if I start moving, actually, I can't even start moving uh, because, you know, you can't click anywhere. So and then you 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 can't see your health. You can't see if you're really in danger too much or anything. If you get attacked, it will flash, but it doesn't really tell you if you're about to die or not. So you're constantly just like checking back like a crazy maniac, you know, like. So, yeah, that could be improved a lot. The map menu is uh, it's fine. Everything is kind of loaded up in here. You have the view reward here, which is like kind of hidden at the end here. It's like super transparent. Took a little bit for me to find it, but that's just whatever. I like that there's objective base here. Really, really fun. That's a really, really good touch. Uh, and you, you got some fun stuff. You can kind of filter this if you're looking for stronghold, if you're looking for like the dungeon and all that stuff. It's pretty cool. It's pretty well done. There's some good stuff in here. There's some good wins, but uh, the UI could use a little bit of work. You can't track more than one quest, which blows my mind. Uh, and the questing system, probably a bug, but if you complete a main quest, half the time what happens is it completes, and then it doesn't flag where the next main quest objective is. So that's a really big problem. So then you need to go back here, you go back here, you click the quest, and then it tracks again, and then you finally know where you gotta go. And you complete it, and then it doesn't track the next step. And then you're like, shit, you go back here, you do this, you know? It would be nice if I could track maybe like three side quests and a main quest, and just know where the hell I gotta go. That would be cool. Um, that's pretty much it. There's obviously some stuff that like having a wheel on PC. Like I know the game has been developed for uh, console, which is actually really good. Like you can literally at any point take your controller and start playing, and that's great for couch play. And and it's so, I'm so happy about this. And when you do need those menu. Uh, it is really, really cool when, when, when you, when you need them. So I'm just going to remember, I don't even remember what the, the key bind is. And there you go. So once you, once you have this, you're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Holy moly. I can choose. I can use my consumable. I can fuck you. You know, that's really nice. Right. But for PC, it just feel like it could have been better. It could have been a PC interface, like not a dial wheel. That's just an opinion, obviously. Whatever, do whatever you want with us. There's obviously a couple of stuff that could be better. You can fully customize it, though, which is really, really cool. Um, but that's pretty nice. So that's pretty much it. It's not like a lot of things, but the UI isn't the best. Um, There's like very simple things where I was trying to make a new character. And like, for example, this button for me did not flash. It blended a lot into that, but I'm getting into the, who cares? Who cares what I think? Who cares? There's a couple of things I think that could be refined. Also, the play button right now is the biggest bait in beta, but I think it should be doing other things later on in the game. But right now, it's just, it's the equivalent of that crystal in Diablo 2 between the chat and the, you know, it just does nothing. But that's probably, that's beta stuff. Who cares? That's beta stuff. Yeah, just a little bit of UI element that could be improved. Uh, there's obviously bug, but you know, who cares about that? But that's pretty much it. That's my rambling for the UI, uh, user interface. There's way more to cover than this. Uh, like when you open up like a stats, uh, like a, like an item, you can literally scroll for like, sometimes you don't even see the legendary power on items that have a lot of things into them. Um, it's, it can be a little bit annoying, right? So there, there's obviously some stuff that are. A little bit problematic. Some items, like, you have to literally scroll. Which, I don't know what the solution is for this. I don't know. But, it is what it is. You have a sword button, at least, which is nice. Which is really cool. So, that's pretty nice. That's it for user interface. This segment was not even planned in my list. I don't know how I forgot about it, but I want to talk about Endgame. And it's a little bit weird because we don't know much about it. I mean, we know a little bit, but we haven't been able to test it. And I'm pretty happy about what it seems like they're going to be doing. I'm pretty happy. It sounds pretty fun. So in general, you're going to have a couple of things you'll be able to do. Um, a lot of world content, which I really love. Not everybody's going to enjoy this because it requires level scaling. It requires MMO technology, which a lot of people don't like. I'm a big fan of it. I love seeing people around me. That's one of the reasons that I used to love Diablo 2. I would always try people to, to play with, uh, join random games for Battle Run and shit. 
I never did those stuff on my own. I always enjoyed having just people around. And it's just added such a nice layer of... It was my first experience with right, really connecting with people and online with video games. And it got me into enjoying World of Warcraft later on and a, a bunch of other games, right? So I love that. I love being able to see people and not necessarily having to hunt for lobbies and, and stuff. I, I, I just love how alive the world feels and things are and how connected it is it introduced a bunch of problem but hopefully things will get fixed with with those things right now right now there's a lot of lag rubber bending and shit but it's beta so um but in general i really like that the world events being able to do open world stuff is really really fun running to the dungeon is really really cool i don't know if we'll end up teleporting there sometimes with the end game stuff with the key that we're going to talk about in a moment for those dungeons but i love that we have to run to the dungeon it feels really cool it feels like the world is connected we don't just open a magic rift portal into the oblivion world of and then a random map is generated it feels a little bit more realistic and i think that's kind of nice uh i liked it so there's like stronghold that you're going to encounter which are like big zones um that you need to clear out and it creates a little village so for example i got this one here if i go there there's vendors and people and uh it's really really nice so stronghold are really really cool they can give some good rewards and then I think after events can spawn, like Legion stuff. I am not too familiar with this, but there's like bigger kind of like invasions type type of event that can happen. Like different than your normal just orange circle happening that you need to step on four circle to give blood to like just more complicated world event that seems really cool. And then there's world boss, right? So there's random world events. There's like Helltide Legion invasion stuff. And then there's world bosses. So those are the three, it seems like, main world content that you're going to encounter, which are going to give you some nice rewards, including currency, blood shard, so that you can gamble and get gear. And then there is the most interesting aspect to me, which is dungeon. So you can craft uh, with sigil powder. You can craft uh, sigil. And these sigil are going to be valid for a random dungeon that you won't choose. So a little bit like Mythic Keystone in World of Warcraft, or mapping a little bit in Path of Exile, right? So when you craft this key, it will be generated for one of the 150 dungeons. I don't think every dungeon can be keyed, though, so I don't want to overstep there. I think only a selected pull of dungeon can become Nightmare Dungeon. Uh, so when you craft a key, it's going to generate a key for one of those dungeons at the difficulty that you choose. So this goes right now all the way from 1 to 100. I'm assuming 100 is going to kick your ass, right? If you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they also have Affliction, so I'm assuming it's going to be different. Either affixes, maybe uh, some penalty, or even just like Affliction, like more density, right? Or it could be random stuff. We don't know what it is. I don't think... I mean, maybe it's out there under NDA. I don't personally know what it is. Uh... No, I'm kidding. I, I I never I didn't play the NBA beta. I don't know what it is. There's like affliction that are happening in those dungeon. It could be like explosive, or like when a monster die, it explodes, or all the monster in there have extra health. There's more density. Whenever you cast uh, frostbolt, it makes a fart sound. I don't know. I have no clue what's in there. It's going to affect the dungeon, increase their difficulty. Most likely, I hope increase the density to enable some build to work. And uh, it's just gonna make me it's just gonna make them more difficult. Reward you with better gear, more gold, more XP, all of those things, and that's gonna be the loop. You're gonna be doing these. You're just gonna be doing random dungeon in the world, get cool resources, and then try to do them as difficult as possible to get as much reward as possible. Uh, and then you can salvage sigil. So I'm assuming it's just if you don't like the key you get, you salvage it, and then not sure, not a hundred percent sure. Uh what salvage sigil is. I'll, I'll have to look into it. So I don't want to talk about it too much. But that's pretty much what it is. That's going to be the end game. That's it. Some people have a problem with that. Obviously, dungeon. For me, personally, I thought that dungeons were pretty different. They had a lot of variety in them. There's obviously like some... I, like, that's just Act 1 out of this entire map. And we've had some pretty cool different tiles. So we've had some like, you know, like barrack kind of style. We've had some ice dungeons, some under like swamp watery caverns some spider caverns some fucking sex dungeon gore shit going on i don't know there's a lot of different tiles a lot of different dungeon it's been really, really cool the problem is the mechanic that you have to do to unlock the golden dose dungeon i think that's where people have an issue 
you're going to be a uh, asked to do task like go get the half thing there go get the half thing there and then make the thing and then put it on the thing and then it's it gets a little bit repetitive right because you see the layer the the, the pattern happen you get there there's like two pedestrian you go like okay let's go north let's go south and you bring them back this one is not too much of a problem the one that i have that i had a problem with was uh kill every monster in the area that is really annoying especially if you play a build that kills with density that's really annoying Right? If you play a build that uses large density to kill things and you have one skeleton in a corner, it's kind of annoying. It, it wasn't fun. And then you have to look for every single red dot on the map. It's like you're doing the den quest all over again. And God knows I fucking hated that quest. The worst bounties in Diablo 3 were the one you had to kill everything on the floor. I, I, I absolutely hated these. So now that that's back, I'm, it's pretty upsetting. It's not really fun. It would be better if it was just like... Once you get in the zone, it would say, you know, like, clear a clear a, 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 a nice amount of evil, please. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Make it 70%, right? So that you can skip some shit and some monster in the corner, right? If you get a rare that you cannot kill in this zone because it has affixes that you can deal with, you're fucked. You lose your dungeon. That sucks. We should be able to skip some of them. Uh, but there's so much feedback that's been going around with this that I doubt they would leave it as it right it would be nice to get a little bit more variety maybe some fun objective uh no, it doesn't have to be fun it just have to feel a little bit different so that you don't do the three same objective you know kill this you know go get this item and like there's obviously some mechanic that are like go get this stone and then you find the stone and it takes you five second to equip the stone on your back it takes five second and any hit anything somebody farts on you it cancels it and it's like Okay, you know, but you can find an actual like silver ore mine on the ground and poof, you explode it, collect all the ore instantly, right? So <laughs> obviously video game logic, nobody cares, but some objective are just a little bit annoying and can get repetitive. Personally, I love the design of the dungeon, how varied they were. Uh, they have a little bit of dynamic uh, routing to them. It's not always the same path. The monster can change pretty nice and we we've only seen like a very small percentage of them so i'm pretty happy with the dungeon just the mechanic could be tweak that could be cool uh but then we're gonna see what happens maybe there's more mechanic later on maybe the nightmare dungeon are gonna bring more mechanic that was the talk about the end game it looks really cool i'm excited about it hopefully they don't do too much daily shit like i love that the world boss is a is a weekly thing or like a you kill it every now and then you get a fat loot you're good to go the rest of the time you grind your hearts out and it feels pretty good all right, so we're back on this scene. One of my favorite scenes in the game. Absolutely amazing. You get the crackling lightning. You get the flashy dagger. You get the... I love this. It's amazing. It's just a conclusion. I just wanted to wrap it up. I've been rambling for, I feel like... I've probably been rambling for like one or two hours easily. I don't know. Maybe this video is just 15 minute long and I've been high this entire time. But it's been a good time. Uh, the beta has been fun. The content has been really enjoyable. Um, and I'm extremely excited about the future. We've given away six copies of, uh, Deluxe Diablo Edition. People were super hype in the stream on Twitch. It's been really, really cool. People are excited about the game. Obviously, people have their little fear about the balance of certain things. I try to be optimistic. We'll see how things evolve. The beta has been really fun so far. The content's been great. The gameplay feels snappy. The itemization is good. Things are great. There's good build customization. And I'm really, really hopeful for the future. I'm going to be playing this day one early access uh, for months and months and months to come. And uh, I'm extremely excited about this game overall. Are there things that they could improve? Yes, I've talked about multiple of them. I don't think the game is necessarily perfect. But for a beta game that's two months away from releasing, if they put a lot of emphasis on fixing the bugs, some of the UI problem, and some of the little quirks here and there... I think we could have a really pretty solid game. And because of the way the monetization is handled, they're probably going to generate a lot of income from skins and uh, transmog and all that stuff, which hopefully will translate into nice, frequent, meaty update. That would be really, really good. So hopefully we get some good stuff, some good changes, and, and frequent every season, and, and we can just keep piling on to this amazing core that this game has right now. It's a very solid foundation, very solid core, 
and it can obviously be optimized uh, a little bit here. But uh, if we can expand on that, and the game could be amazing. So hopefully every season we get some new stuff, and hopefully we get some expansions to pile on, and uh, hopefully we can we can have an amazing experience. Okay, my voice is absolutely dead right now. I've been recording and talking and rambling for a while. Hopefully you enjoy the video. I really wanted to do this. This game means a lot to me right now. It's It's been an absolute blast. It's been really, really fun. Uh, and I cannot wait to play this. I'm sad right now that I have to wait two months uh, for this game to come out. But it's been really good. Hopefully you've been enjoying it as well. I'm going to do a lot more content uh, coming soon for Diablo. Uh, and as soon as the game comes out, we're just going to be doing builds and fun stuff. And, and, and so make sure you just let me know if you enjoy this, if you want more. Drop a like, subscribe, all that jazz that people tell you every video. You're supposed to do it at the start because people never watch the end. But if you're still here, I love you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, see you in the world of Sanctuary, my friends.